Reddit, what's a secret your job keeps from the public? Olive Garden Server, you can get three free wine samples every time you go. When we present yours and someone else's profile in front of an employer at the same time, a lot of times, one of you is there to make the other look better. About a quarter of all the gonorrhea we find is in the throat, and a new study suggests transmission from quote-unquote deep kissing. Not necessarily a secret, but it's challenging to get other providers to do testing for all sites at risk. Just a reminder, whenever you go for your routine STD testing, make sure every orifice that's touched a pink part gets swabbed. Worked in a no-kill animal shelter. The thing is, no-kill still does mean you have to put animals down sometimes. Especially behavioral issues are terrible. When is a dog too dangerous? Can you rehome a pit bull with a bite history? What if they get too dangerous for staff to handle? Especially when it gets out that we have to put a specific animal down and all those Facebook warriors start rioting and calling you names. It's not like we make those decisions for fun. I work at a cemetery, and I can confirm that the concrete or metal vaults that the casket goes inside of in the ground do not keep the caskets from getting wet. Actually, they do the opposite and just hold water inside. The sales team will always try to paint a nice picture in your head of what the casket slash vault combo will look like in the ground, and it's a complete lie. One of many lies in the cemetery and funeral business. We claim to be a leader on the technology front, but we are literally running off of Excel macros with random codes that no one knows how to understand slash correct without causing the entire company to crash. A lot of companies, even Fortune 500 companies, are just houses of cards. Shiny on the surface, then you get inside and you realize how much of the organization is dependent on Excel. You learn they're dependent on legacy systems akin to DOS, and you learn that things are constantly breaking, and the only thing keeping the whole company from imploding is people constantly fixing the things that go wrong. I work at a major chemical plant upriver from a major city. If it came out how old, run down, and poorly maintained literally all of the equipment that we use to make sure that hundreds of millions of gallons of contaminated water don't leak or straight up spill into the river, the EPA would shut down every plant on the river. However, the EPA is aware of how inefficient and poorly disposed all our waste products are. The plant I work for has a yearly budget dedicated to paying fines. Your child's school report is probably word for word the same as half of their class. There's only so many ways you can say, works hard but needs to focus on accuracy. At the hospital, they have secret employees who walk around to make sure doctors and nurses sanitize their hands before entering and exiting a patient's room. You'd be surprised how many don't follow protocol and end up getting written up in a day. The chicken bites aren't cooked to order. The fries look darker today not because they're extra crispy, but because the shift manager was too lazy to change the oil, which should be changed every five hours. The house sauce is just mayo, ketchup, paprika, and pickle brine. The sticky patch outside the bathroom might be pee. Worked in a library for two years. We don't make diddly squat from your book or DVD finds. They're designed to be a deterrent more than anything else. And under the right circumstances, we're very amenable to just making them go away. If you had a tough week and couldn't make it to the library to return your books, we could work something out. Laughing about being too lazy to bring them back slash forgetting you had them entirely? Yeah, those fines aren't going anywhere. That being said, libraries don't like to penalize people who can't pay their fines. If your kid has so many fines that the computer locks him out so he can't do his homework, we're usually more than happy to help you get logged on for the day. We want to give students the assistance they need, but if a school is the one to test slash diagnose a child for autism disorders, then we are the ones that have to pay for all the follow-up medical help. All of our videos are made by the same people, in the same building, and we just changed the text slash logo. All of the interviews are scripted too, they literally feed the lines to the subjects. Because they don't want to pay us a fair wage or give us benefits, we also don't have to sign anything, meaning no NDA. Dodo slash Thrillist slash Now This. Wow, I literally just got fired. It's not because of this post, I just think the timing is hilarious. We bill by the hour, but no one who works in this industry monitors their time closely. I work in a public library. Sadly, since we're open to all, we get a lot of indigent customers. In this day and age, that means a lot of opiate users, many of whom shoot up in our restrooms. We've had many overdoses, most of which are treated quickly and effectively by administering Narcan. However, that's not always the case, and some people are either beyond saving or are found too late. In 2019 alone, we've had 13 deaths. 
Security and the EMTs are always careful to make it appear that the body being wheeled out is only ill, so as to not freak out the patrons. The actual number of deaths is even hidden from the staff. I'm friends with a few of the folks in security, which is how I know so much about it. Edit. Obligatory holy crap I did not expect this to get so much attention. A lot of people have mentioned installing blue lights as a deterrent. That's been looked into and discussed in depth. Unfortunately, what we've discovered is that they're largely ineffectual. When they can't see their veins, they just jab themselves until they hit pay dirt, and all it really does is increase the number of infections and abscesses. The bathrooms are going to be remodeled in the next year to make them less user-friendly, so to speak. Many people have asked where this particular library is. I'm not going to say. However, the fact that people have guessed San Francisco, Philadelphia, Denver, and even Canada illustrates that this is a widespread problem and that we're sadly far from unique. Thanks to all the other library workers who have shared their stories below, it's unfortunate that libraries are forced to deal with social issues outside the scope of our normal operations, but I maintain that libraries are a foundational pillar of civilization. We now have several full-time trained social workers on staff to help deal with the situation and have effective programs in place to help people get their lives back on track. Most of the time, all it takes for a free upgrade is being polite. My manager will literally ask us, are they being nice? Unless it's the weekend slash a show night, then we literally do not have the availability. Yes, even if it's a show that you are not personally interested in going to. For everyone asking what I do, just assume it's like this everywhere, because it usually is. I'm a special education teacher, and the amount of injuries people sustain while working in this field is staggering. I teach high school, and the kids can go until they are 21. So, most of the violent students are adult-sized. We get concussions, bites, broken wrists and arms, scalped, as well as inappropriately assaulted by students who will grab you by your breast, pull out their member, and start pleasuring themselves. By the way, I like my job very much and enjoy working with the students. However, there is little public knowledge of how dangerous the position is. We're supposed to be teaching information literacy, but none of us really checks to see if our student sources are legit or not. Edit. A lot of people are commenting about turn it in. We use safe assign. Those are only capable of flagging for plagiarism. What I'm talking about is checking to see if when a student cites a source for a claim, if that source actually said it, and if that source is at all reliable. There's no software for that. The longer I'm in engineering, the more I know that we don't get the design right so much as we just go with the best we have the moment we run out of time or budget. Goodwill has their own landfills for things that don't sell. Things sit on shelves for weeks with continuous price decrease, then one last shot at selling at the outlet stores where everything is priced per pound. Also, I was just saying that because of the title. Don't get me wrong, the programs and community work they do is great. Municipal worker, we do actually work hard and care about the city, and it's hard on us when people stop slash call to yell at us without getting all the facts and we know we can't really defend ourselves. Most of the time, you are reaming out a laborer who has no control over your taxes or which street is getting paved. Fellow city utility guy here, y'all mother have no clue how hard city workers actually work for you, how many people come in late at night or on holidays to fix shit, or how fast we actually do respond to problems. I'm sorry your crumbled curb in front of your house or whatever didn't get fixed this year, but we literally have 20 people for the entire city, and they are busy making sure you have clean and safe water 24-7-365. And now, for something completely different. If you're polite and it's the end of the day, I will give you free baked goods I made earlier. Delivery driver, we had 10 to 15 minutes on the estimated delivery times, so we seem speedy and not seem late if we're stuck in traffic. We also charge delivery fees that most people don't notice or ask about. Yeah, I'm going to share my personal experience with this one. Some of my friends in need needed someone to spot them for delivery, so I would pay for their food. Grubhub is especially bad about this. I once paid double what my friend ordered because of delivery fees alone. In a perfect world where people are actually paid fairly, a $14 sandwich combo should not be $28 because of delivery fees. I used to work for a pesticide company spraying flies on farms. Some of the poisons we used were so strong that one pint added to a 500-gallon tank of water and sprayed could knock flies right out of the air immediately and was just as toxic to birds. In fact, we were told if we ever accidentally spilled a bottle of stuff on the ground, we should contact the EPA to clean the mess rather than try to do it ourselves. Ironically, by fall, the flies had developed such a resistance to the poison that the only way it would kill them was if you drowned them in it. Would still kill birds, though. One last thing, 
It was an organic pesticide that could be absorbed through any unprotected skin of the human body. I worked there just one year because of this. I don't have a job, but back when I was 12 to 15, I would sometimes help out with the family businesses, which was selling coffee and twisted chips. When we first started, the thing that attracted people was that we would always have baked goods up for grabs and everyone loved it. The reality was that we all bought it from Costco, put it in different packaging, and played it off as if we made them ourselves. This went on for two years within the business. Not my industry anymore, but banks would often make decisions that were probably technically illegal about which houses to repair. I currently work at a drug and alcohol rehab. Alcoholics Anonymous has an abysmal success rate if you measure success by continuous sobriety over a significant period of time. And that is how AA tends to do measure it. But because one drink is considered failure, a lot of people drop out of AA out of shame and it takes them a long time to get sober again, if ever. I've seen people with 20 plus years of sobriety beat themselves up and feel like failures over one night of drinking. Various harm reduction interventions have higher success rates. Harm reduction strategies measure success by drinking slash using less often, in smaller quantities, and more responsibly. If you were pretty messed up all last year, but you're sober often enough to show up for work most days this year, that's success. Here's the big shocker. Most problem drinkers and drug users recover on their own without treatment. By recovery, I mean learning how to have a functional relationship with alcohol and drugs. I know a few people in our community that were court-ordered to rehab and or AA years ago and stopped going as soon as they didn't have to anymore. They aren't 100% sober all the time now, but they go to work every day, they have happy marriages, they take good care of their children, they don't get arrested, and they don't get behind the wheel drunk or high. I'm not saying 12-step programs are worthless. Some do stay sober the rest of their lives and are happy. I think that's success but it's not the solution for everyone. Unfortunately, rehabs that use different treatment models tend not to receive government funding. Courts tend not to refer defendants to harm reduction. And AA unfortunately perpetuates the myth that permanent sobriety is the only alternative to prison, the madhouse, or death, and that AA is the only place to achieve permanent sobriety. We tell customers that we have a supplier we get our parts from for repairs. Amazon. Our supplier is Amazon. Maybe not the public, but they'd probably be shut down if OSHA or the FDA found out. Current job at an HVAC company. My bosses in the office know that about half their employees, mostly supervisors, are doing drugs. From red eye to hard drugs. Out on the road, on the roof, wherever. Bosses in the office might be doing drugs, and they even let us know every year about the annual drug test, which I'm pretty sure is supposed to be random. Might not be. Still sketchy with regards to the above. Not like, you guys know what time of year it is, I hope you can pass. More like, the drug test is in three months, that's probably enough time to pass if you stop now, without actually saying anything that could implicate them. Also, they don't care if we're safe. They just want the jobs done because they overbooked them and need us to move fast. One guy fell off a ladder from 25 feet, he's been doing physical rehab, they refuse to pay workers comp for him, and they are trying to get him to come back to work when he literally shouldn't be doing anything other than lifting a cup for a drink. I've had multiple times where I want to put my harness and lanyard on because the roof is 30 feet or more from the ground, and my direct supervisor for that week gives me crap and tells me to hurry up because it's a waste of time. Most of the supervisors on the road don't wear the required safety gear when they should. Supervisors don't give a crap either. They just want to move fast so they can keep their numbers up. Guarantee if I got seriously injured, they would ask if I could still work, not call 911 to help me. Edit. I apologize in advance for how long this is. I got hurt today. Nothing major, I think. I had to take two 6-inch and 12 to 15 feet hoses apart because we were leaving to go home. My supervisor, standing 6 feet away, sees me struggling and doesn't help. They were stuck pretty good. So I got angry. All the crap I dealt with this week ended up in me using all my strength to pull one of the hoses up to free it from the other one. It came up and the metal end that connected it to the other hose smacked me in the arm, causing a huge bruise and popped a line of blood vessels right below the epidermis and it started bleeding, but not profusely. This normally wouldn't bother me, I have a decent pain tolerance. Except the bruise is located on the part of my arm above where the tendons to your fingers are. I tore the rest of the setup down with one arm due to me not being able to touch two fingers together, let alone grab something. He didn't ask if I was okay or needed help, he just looked at me after I yelled, Ah, frick! and walked away and off the roof. Yes, I know this is my fault, not looking for sympathy or anything. Crap happens. Just an update on how crappy these people are on the job. Burger King worker here. The ice cream machine isn't broken. It just needs cleaning, which takes a long time. Cap. Stop the cap. 
right now. I know this is anecdotal evidence, but come on. How many times have you gone to a Burger King or McDonald's or wherever and the ice cream machine is quote unquote broken every time? I'm advocating for corporate transparency. Uh, no, better yet, I'm advocating for ice cream machine solidarity. No ice cream means the world suffers a little bit more because of you, Burger King. Because of you. Lots of professors are winging their lectures, and showing up to office hours really does help your chances of a good grade. A former adjunct can confirm. Although, to be fair, those who do wing it generally know the stuff well enough that it's not an issue. I did it a couple of times for whatever reason, and it always ended up very poorly, so I pretty much always prepped. A lot. And yes, showing up to office hours really does help. The caveat is that you have to show up and show that you care and that you are putting in work. I've had students be surprised that I didn't bump up their grades because, after all, they did go to office hours. Once. At the beginning of the semester. For a very simple question. I've told the story before, but I had a class my freshman year that, honestly, I started skipping. It was early, the class was notoriously difficult, and I was having trouble grasping it. It was divided into three parts, one test after each third, and then a final overall. And for the first two, I pretty much never went to class. First third, I didn't give a crap. Second third, I had a surgery on my foot, and it was tough for me to get across campus. After the second test, where I scored somewhere around a 20%, I realized I screwed up big time. I went to her after class and was like, look, I screwed up. Is there anything I can do to pass this class? Needless to say, she was not impressed. She said, all right, if you come to every, and I mean every class, and every single office hours, you might be able to squeak out a pass. Well, I'll be darned if I didn't go to every office hours, except one that I missed with the flu, on crutches, and worked my butt off to learn a semester's worth of material in a month. When I took the third test, I got the highest grade in the class, just shy of 100. She had mercy on me and let me retake the second test due to the surgery, and I aced that one as well. She told me that she was impressed with how quickly I grasped the material, and out of every student she ever gave that ultimatum to, I was the only one who actually followed through. Going into the final, I calculated that if I scored 100% on it, I could just barely get a B-, which honestly was more than I deserved given the way I ditched class all semester. I passed the final. When I checked my final grade, she gave me an A for the class. That taught me a valuable lesson about putting in the effort and going to office hours. Not at current company, but former one. Everyone had to take additional coursework on business ethics and anti-corruption laws because a subsidiary was found bribing officials to sell the company's products. A clinical trial for Parkinson's failed because of serious adverse events, resulting in at least three deaths related to the product. It's now being reformulated and will go through clinical trials again as an arthritis medication. Another clinical trial failed because it was found to be toxic for Asian blood cells. They had originally tried to bypass this by excluding Asians from the trial. Just to be clear, not all pharma companies are like this. There's always a few bad apples. If you get a call from a telemarketing or research call center, you need to specifically ask to be taken off the call list for them to stop calling. Don't be polite and make excuses. Don't mention that you don't have the time. Don't mention the time at all. Don't even just hang up. All of those will often have the company assume on a technicality that you could technically take the call at a later time. Just straight up ask to be taken off their call list or put on their do not call list. You didn't hear this from me. Not my current job, but I used to work as a front desk agent in hotels. Hotels can and do book more rooms than are available. Most systems allow sites like Expedia to book the hotel to 102%. Expedia bookings are the lowest priority. If you don't want to get bumped, book from the hotel's own website. Also, be aware that at midnight, the booking system rolls over to the next day. If you need a room after midnight, call the hotel. If you're a regular customer who doesn't tip your delivery driver, your order is never going to be a priority. I work at a university facilities department. My colleagues actually really do care about the students, student research, and opportunities at uni and beyond for students. This shouldn't be a secret, but I am constantly and consistently impressed by how much our electricians, custodial staff, EHS, you name it, care about the students excelling and achieving. When you subscribe, make sure to hit the bell to turn on notifications. Put the playlist on in the background to finish listening to all the stories linked at the top of the description. And if you like Am I the Genius, give Am I the Jerk a shot, linked in the description too. 
Either way, thanks a lot for watching, and we'll see you guys next time.